about uh, a different philosopher and some of the stuff that they've said about this. So I want to tell you about a guy named Peter Singer. So Peter Singer is definitely the most influential philosopher in the contemporary animal liberation movement, right? whether you think of that in terms of animal rights or animal welfare. And he's been arguing famously since the 1970s that we are morally required radically to change our attitudes towards and treatment of non-human animals. He says, he, he thinks of this movement as a liberation movement, and he says, a liberation movement demands an expansion of our moral horizons and an extension or reinterpretation of the basic moral principle of equality. So just so you know, uh, when I give you page number references to Singer, because we're going to be talking about Singer for a few more slides here, they're all, they all refer to his piece, All Animals Are Equal, are equal, which again I've uploaded to the recommended reading module. And this is not about that that article is not about distributive justice. It's not a required reading. It's merely recommended, but it's one of my all-time favorite pieces of moral philosophy. Uh, in fact, it turned me into a vegetarian within months of my first reading it almost 15 years ago. So uh, check it out. Uh, even if you don't, though, here are the important points that I want to talk about. I want to talk about this basic moral principle of equality because I think Singer's discussion can help shed light on Nielsen's discussion. All right, so one of Singer's major goals in that piece that I just mentioned is to explain what that basic moral principle of equality actually amounts to. Now, since he believes that this basic moral principle of equality applies to humans and non-human animals, does that mean that humans and non-human animals are exactly the same in every respect? Or that they should be treated in exactly the same ways? Or that they have exactly the same rights? No. Right? Those would be silly things to think, and they would be uh, a ridiculous part of an animal liberation um, ideology. Right? As Singer himself acknowledges, there are important differences between humans and other animals, and these differences must give rise to some differences in the rights that each have. But recognizing this obvious fact, however, is no barrier to the case of extending, for extending the basic principle of equality to non-human animals. Right, so he says that, look, not only do these, there, are there important differences between humans and non-humans, there's also important differences among human beings, and that sometimes these differences can give rise to different rights. So here's Singer again. He says, for example, since a man cannot have an abortion, it's meaningless to talk of his right to have one. Since a pig can't vote, it's meaningless to talk of its right to vote. The basic principle of equality is equality of consideration, and equal consideration for different beings may lead to different treatment and different rights. Right? So, however we end up understanding the basic moral principle of equality, it's compatible with it that you and I might have different rights, as Sager just argued. Right? Uh, if, even if we think that men and women are equal, morally speaking, right, that doesn't mean that both men and women both have a right to an abortion. Right? Women might have such a right without men having that. Right? Likewise, even if we think that the basic moral principle of equality extends to non-human animals, that doesn't mean that we have to think that both humans and non-humans uh, have or should have the right to vote. Right? No. Um, sometimes differences in characteristics between people or beings give rise to differences in the rights we have. Right? And then here's coming more directly to our point. It's also compatible with the basic moral principle of equality that you and I can be treated differently in certain ways, even if we're both equal in an important moral respect. So here's an example that I, I like. So suppose that you're studying with two of your friends for a, a final exam that's coming up, and you're, start, you're all starting to get kind of tired. You need a little break. And you think that uh, going to get a sweet snack for everybody will help you all power through and finish studying the stuff you need to study. Now suppose that, uh, as you know, your friend, let's call them A, likes chocolate but hates fruit of all kinds, whereas your other friend that you're studying with, friend B, is the other way around and really likes fruit of all kinds but hates chocolate. What a weirdo, but that's what they like and don't like. 
Now, suppose you head down to the cafeteria or the cafe or whatever uh, to get everybody, you and your two friends, some sweet snacks for studying. What should you do? Should you get everybody chocolate? Should you get everybody fruit? Or should you do something else? Well, intuitively, what you should do here is you should get friend A chocolate and you should get friend B a piece of fruit. Right? But look, you're treating them differently, right? In a very straightforward sense. Right? You're getting one thing for friend A, you're getting a different thing for friend B. But you're both kind of you're you're paying equal attention to both of them in treating them in these ways. Right? So this would be an example where uh, even if two people, right, good friends of yours, are morally equal, that's not, that doesn't imply that you can't treat them in somewhat different ways, right, based on differences between them. In this case, which kinds of sweet things they like or don't like. So as Singer says, the basic moral principle of equality is equality of consideration. And so now our question is, what does equal moral consideration consist in? Well, here is Singer's answer. And this answer, even if it's not exactly the same as Nielsen's, can help us make sense of other stuff going forward. Singer says that the interests of every being affected by an action are to be taken into account and given the same weight as the like interests of any other being. Right? Now, this basic idea should be pretty familiar to us from utilitarianism. Right? And Singer himself is a utilitarian. But the basic idea is not dependent on utilitarianism. Right? The basic idea is just that to show equal consideration for two people or two beings uh, is to give equal attention to their interests. Right? Same, to give the same weight to the like interests of the people. Right? As Singer says, the claim to equality between people or whatever does not depend on intelligence, moral capacity, physical strength, or similar matters of fact. Equality is a moral ideal, not a simple assertion of fact. There's no logically compelling reason for assuming that a factual difference in ability between two people justifies any difference in the amount of consideration we give to satisfying their needs and interests. The principle of the equality of human beings is not a description of an alleged actual equality among humans. It's a prescription. Right? It tells us how we should behave, how we should regard people or treat people. All right. So as Singer puts it, equal consideration means that we give the same weight to like interests of anybody affected by our actions. All right now, this can help us make sense of the different rights and different treatment cases mentioned earlier. Right, so uh, you can give equal equal weight to the interests of men and women while acknowledging that only women could have a right to an abortion. Right, or only people with a uterus could have a right to an abortion. Uh, likewise, right, you you give the same weight to the like interests of your two friends by getting one of them chocolate and getting the other one fruit. Right, so this is, hopefully this is all starting to make some, some sense, how these things can come apart. Okay, now, this is not to say, none of this is to say that Nielsen agrees with Peter Singer about the details here. Okay, that's not the point of me bringing all of this stuff up. Rather, my point in discussing the Singer is to try to help you understand and sympathize with some of the unavoidable complexity involved in thinking seriously about equality, right? Because we're going to have this distinction that Nielsen's going to put a lot of weight on later between kind of equal consideration, or as he puts it, equal respect, and equal treatment. Okay, those are different. All right, he says, remember what he says is that everyone has a right to respect and to an equal respect, and that none can be treated as second-class people, but this does not mean that in treating them with respect, you treat them in an identical way, right? Now, having worked through the singer, we hopefully have a better idea of how this distinction between equal respect, which is probably similar to what Singer calls equality of consideration, and equal treatment might work. Okay, so Nielsen will address some of this stuff directly later on, but having this grounding, I think, will be helpful for when we get there. All right. So now let's go back to Nielsen. And Nielsen, as you all know, uh, presents two principles of justice, just like Rawls does. And I'm going to present Niels' principles in a kind of Rawls-like way so we can compare the two views more easily later. So here's Nielsen's first principle. It says that each person is to have an equal right 
to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties and opportunities, including equal opportunities for meaningful work, for self-determination, and political participation, compatible with a similar treatment of all. As Nielsen says, this principle gives expression to a commitment to attain and or sustain equal moral autonomy and equal self-respect. Right, that's his first principle. And Nielsen's second principle says that after provisions are made for common social or community values, for capital overhead to preserve the society's productive capacity, and allowances are made for differing unmanipulated needs and preferences, the income and wealth, or the common stock of means, is to be so divided that each person will have a right to an equal share. As Nielsen puts it, the necessary burdens requisite to enhance well-being are also to be equally shared, subject, of course, to limitation by differing abilities in differing situations. Okay, so all this is on pages 211 and 212. All right, so here, those are Nielsen's two principles. Now, much of the day is going to be us comparing Nielsen and Rawls. Right, so we have Nielsen's two principles on the upper left there, and Rawls' two principles on the upper right. So let's talk first about their first principle. Now, one difference. So obviously, Nielsen's first principle is very similar to Rawls's first principle. One main difference, though, is that Nielsen does not claim the strict priority for his principle, first principle that Rawls does for his. Right, so that might be important. Okay, so for Rawls, right, you cannot violate these liberties talked about in principle A for the sake of greater efficiency or equality or utility or whatever. Right? You can't ever do it. Equality, or sorry, liberty takes priority, as Rawls said. But Nielsen doesn't assert that. Right? For Nielsen, uh, these, these liberties are extremely important and only to be violated when something of great importance is at issue, but he at least allows for the possibility that uh, equality or uh, efficiency or whatever could justify um, violations of certain liberties. Okay, now uh, here's Nielsen's understanding of the importance of these two principles. He says that they require, or sorry, the principles of principles one and a, his and Rawls' first principles. He says they require an acceptance of each other's moral autonomy and indeed equal moral autonomy. There can be no popes or dictators, no bosses and bossed. Any authority that obtains must be rooted in at least some form of hypothetical consent. It says, we must all, if we are not children, mentally defective or senile, be in a position to control the design of our own lives. And we must, in our collective decisions, have the right to an equal say. Right, and it's this stuff that Nielsen thinks is protected by, or should be protected by, this first him and his and Rawls' first principles.